Good afternoon and welcome to Utah State University's 2023 State of the University Address. I'm Bill Plate, Vice President for University Marketing and Communications. Today's address is scheduled to last approximately 90 minutes and we will have time at the end for questions. For those of you in person today, we do have microphones here in the auditorium. And for those of you joining us via AggieCast, please use the ask a question button in the upper right hand corner of your browser to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We will get to as many questions as possible today. It is now my honor to introduce USU's 16th president. Noelle Cockett began her tenure as our president in 2017 after serving in many other administrative and faculty roles during her 30 plus career here at USU. As I'm sure that you know, last November, President Cockett announced that she will be stepping down as president at the end of this June. This will be her final State of the University address. President Cockett's forward focus has enabled the university to flourish despite an ever-changing higher education landscape. Since her leadership began, USU has consistently ranked in the top 10 among public universities in the nation for social mobility, research, and service and most recently earned the R1 Carnegie Classification for Excellence in Research. As a champion for student-centered initiatives, her attention to student success has allowed for many accomplishments, including welcoming the university's largest first-year class. Despite daunting admission trends for universities across the nation, the fall of 2020 class included a 16% increase in first-generation students. Under President Cockett's leadership, USU also saw a 16% increase in student completion of certificates and degrees and celebrated more than 25 years of excellence in online education, which is consistently ranked in US News and World Report top 20 during her time as president. President Cockett has been a visionary leader, setting a strategic course for growth, stability, and forward momentum that will carry us into the future. Her tenure will continue to have a long impact will have an impact long after she leaves her post. Please join me in welcoming President Cockett to the podium. Well, thanks, Bill, for that terrific introduction, although he did take some of the things I was going to mention and uh, and already presented those. Uh, Do you catch that? It's going to be 90 minutes. I'm going to stand up here and talk for 90 minutes, so be prepared. No, that's not true. We've scheduled 90 minutes. I don't think it'll take that long, and the idea is absolutely to get questions, so be thinking of those questions uh, for at the end. And welcome to all those folks on AggieCast who are sitting in front of their computers somewhere uh, on campus or all across the state. So as Bill said, this is our annual State of the University talk. Years ago, Stan Albrecht, the previous president, would go and take this uh, presentation to each college, uh, but it was always the same. And so we decided to do a single uh, presentation for everyone all at once. In addition to the legislative update, uh, because we just finished the 2023 legislative session, it's also a great time to share our successes and the terrific things that are happening here at the university. So as I often do, I start with our students in this. And so as Bill mentioned, uh, this fall, fall 2022, we had the largest incoming class ever. And it shows some of the statistics down there. Logan, uh, Logan campus, 13.3% all across the whole USU system, we had 14.1%. And one of the things that we've really been focusing is to bring college to people and families who may not have that in their history. And we measure that as first-generation students 
and we're up 16.3% there. Uh, we also do have an increase in total enrollment in fall 2022 of 1 1.9, and it shows uh, the breakdown there. Particularly excited that our Latinx student population uh, in this year is up 10.2% from the previous year. The only downside that I can see in our enrollment numbers is we're a bit down in graduate enrollment. This is actually occurring all across the country as students, uh, particularly international students, are, are wondering about entering grad school at this point in time. Um, as uh, Bill also shared with the group, once again, spoil, you know, a story spoiler, um, we are up on the percentage of completions we have. Now, this trajectory was looking absolutely fabulous there in fall 2020, but you'll notice the number of completions, that's the top of the bar, is actually dropped a little, um, about 250 students from uh, spring 21 to spring 22. That's when we uh, calculate the graduations, the awards. And this can be everything across uh, all of our campus, but we have um, excluded workforce and TE tech ed just to keep it in line with our enrollments. Now we've done this uh, increased number of completions while keeping enrollment flat. So when you think about that, uh, completions are keeping the students here and getting them done in a timely manner. So we are doing that absolutely incredibly well. Enrollments though, when you're graduating more, you're pushing more out at the end, even keeping the enrollment flat is a challenge. You're need, we're needing more students into the beginning in order to uh, hold that enrollment. But uh, from all I can see, things are going great in both enrollment and completions. Now you might be questioning what happened there. Why did we drop in completions? And the answer is the COVID worldwide pandemic. Um, I know a lot of things get uh, blamed to COVID, but this one is true. What happened was in fall 2021, if you can remember back to that, we went to a lot, we were still doing a lot of remote instruction. Uh, we had spaced out classrooms. Uh, we were changing a lot of the ways that we were teaching and the students decided not to take as many student credit hours. So that big dip uh, right in 2021 is fall 2021 and the number of student credit hours they were taking. And of a particular concern is the bottom line, that's our seniors. So if seniors were taking less credits, fewer of them were actually re ready to graduate in spring 22. And we think this explains that dip in the completion. Unfortunately, this drop off in credits could continue, that effect could continue to lag uh, over time, at least for the foreseeable future, as students now need to come back and uh, take more credits. And even that following semester, they're still not back at the level we'd like to see them. So I think we're gonna see this COVID effect on this reduction in student credit hours, like I said, for a few more years, not just a graduation this last spring. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about, we've talked about enrollments now, research, great, great accomplishments there. We continue to increase that research expenditures. Um, now expenditures is a better way to count research than just total research funding. Some grants will come in, they might be for a year, they might be for three years, they might be for five years. So rather than counting when the grant or contract is awarded, we look at how the grants and contracts are spent, and that's research expenditures. But the really, really exciting thing about this is we are on a very, very steady increase. And because of that, 
we have actually moved up in research rankings from when we compare ourselves to our, uh, our peers. This is a group of land grants listed right there uh, that the Board of Higher Education has is comparing us to. And these are, these are terrific land grants. Few are a little bit larger than us, a few are a little bit smaller. But uh, since last year, we have actually uh, exceeded University of Nebraska Lincoln's uh, expenditure and were be right behind Washington State University. And when you think of the power of these uh, institutions that we're holding our own very, very remarkably, uh, it's a point of pride that all of us can have in our research program here at Utah State. Um, now I just want to go through some highlights of things. It's actually been a little bit hard to pick what I wanted to highlight for this last year. And that would be, you know, uh, um, 2022 as well as this first part of 23. One of the things I wanted to mention that not everyone may know about is we have started a very formal partnership with Fort Valley State University. It's an historic black college and university located in Georgia. Um, and this actually wasn't uh, just a random partnership. It was first organized by one of our alumni, Tai Kui, who graduated from USU in the 60s. He's an African American that came here to play football, uh, but he fell in love with Utah State, and he felt that now what we are, we can do so much by partnering with a historic black uh, college and university and help share the, the things that we both do. And so we selected Fort Valley State University, again, not randomly, but because the president who's standing there next to me is Paul Jones. Paul uh, and his wife, Sylvia, are, were both African-American athletes who came here in the 80s, and he now is the president of Fort Valley. He's done that about seven years. So this idea of partnering with um, people who know Utah State, who have lived here in Cache Valley, is just an incredible opportunity. So we've gone out, uh, and they've come here several times. Uh, there we can see the two student government presidents are flanking Paul and me, as well as um, our first gentleman from USU, John, and our first lady at Fort Valley, Sylvia, and then other administrators. In fact, some of the leadership here at USU are in Fort Valley uh, this week. Again, looking for ways that we can build this partnership. We brought three students here from Fort Valley last Last summer, they attended the Agricultural Biotech Academy, had a great experience. We hope more will come. We're looking for sharing Washington, D.C. internships, uh, getting our student government together, and also our faculty and administrators. So one of the things we're looking for is more uh, ground up participation in this partnership. So if you have some uh, interest in that, whether you're a faculty member, a student, an administrator, please let me know. We'll find that relationship that you can establish with Fort Valley. These have been incredible friendships. That's what I want to tell you. We're not just doing this because we want a partnership with a historic black college. We're doing this because we are creating lifetime partnerships and friendships with these people. And it's really very, very awarding on both sides. The next thing, um, we did do uh, a ribbon cutting. Now, it was last fall, um, so it seems like a while ago, but we verified it did help happen in the 22-23 year, and that was at our U.S. Moab campus. Um, that's Leanna Edgeberger, the associate vice president for that campus, uh, talking with the people. And one of the things that was absolutely surprising were the number of community members that came to that ribbon cutting. There were over 300 people. So in a place like Moab, USU opening up a new educational extension building 
is a big event. We are there providing education, extension, um, and research to that community, and they appreciate it. One of the things we were able to add to that program in or that campus that hadn't been there before was tech ed. And through uh, generous donations from various donors, we actually were able to add welding, building construction, and then really build health science labs in the areas of pharmacy, surgical tech, and nursing. All professions that a place like Moab can really build uh, on the momentum there. So really, it was a wonderful, wonderful event. If you get to Moab, go see it. This first combustion-free net zero building is spectacular. Another accomplishment uh, was approved by our board of trustees. Our chair, uh, Kent Alder, is here today in person. Uh, the board of trustees approved the Haravi Peace Institute. Um, the person at the microphone in that slide is Mehdi Haravi. He has an incredible history of being in Iran, uh, he was actually in solitary confinement, arrested by the government of Iran, uh, and has seen how critical peace is for a country. And through his experiences, as well as several of the faculty across campus, primarily in the humanities and social sciences, he realized that we could actually create a program that helps people understand what it takes, whether it's individuals, whether it's communities, whether it's countries, what it takes to have peace. And so very, very excited about this. Uh, we will soon be announcing the director of the Harabi Peace Institute, and then we'll, we've already got students clamoring to start taking uh, classes and get into this major and minor. So really excited about that. Fits USU like a glove. Uh, the next accomplishment I wanted to uh, bring up is fundraising. We had the largest year of fundraising, private philanthropy, gifts from individuals, foundations, uh, that we ever had last year. It was $110 million. Um, part of that was because of the largest gift we've ever gotten for USU, and that's the Bastion Center. This is a 150-acre center that's in South Salt Lake. It used to be the Salt Lake County Equestrian Center, and that now belongs to USU. And the opportunity for programming there is endless. We're looking at refugee communities, possibly a veterans uh, a place where veterans can um, have their uh, community. We're doing youth. We're doing agriculture. Uh, just a lot of really terrific things. So we appreciate the Bastons making that happen. Then on the night that's in that slide, that's Brian Steed and the Rossi family, Ellen Rossi, her husband and one of her sons, we launched the Create Your Aggie Impact. So in fundraising, prior to our Vice President Matt White joining us, in fundraising it was always done with USU asking donors to please help us with what we needed. And you know, sometimes donors don't want to help you with that. They might have a different interest. They might have a different objective. So Matt has helped us understand, turn that fundraising 180 degrees. Instead of telling the donors what we want, ask the donors what they want to do. Where do they want to make their impact? And it is making an incredible difference. It's making us incredibly successful in fundraising. So create your Aggie impact just even at that night. We gave them cards and they wrote what they wanted to do, how they wanted to change Utah State, how they wanted to help students or faculty or programs. So I think this is going to be an incredible future for fundraising at USU. Um, not only did Matt bring a new philosophy for fundraising, he also helped lift 
the USU Foundation Board so much that this year we received the National John W. Nason Award for Board Leadership. Uh, we were the institution that was chosen to receive that because of how strong our relationship is between the institution and the Foundation Board. And again, Matt, his colleagues, uh, very, very successful in what they're doing under uh, fundraising. Uh, next accomplishment, we have some really great uh, coaches and student athletes. Now, um, I heard John Hartwell, the previous athletic director, always said there's a reason we put students first in the name student athletes. USU believes in making sure these student athletes are successful, not only in their sport, but also add uh, in their academics. And so one of the many kudos we've gotten in the Mountain West is that in this last year, 191 student uh, athletes uh, who received honors for their academics, um, the highest in the Mountain West. But we can tick off other ways, highest GPA, highest graduation rate, et cetera. Our student athletes are really performing uh, in their programs. And then I've just included a couple of different things. Just this last year, how well our um, athletics uh, in conferences are doing. Now, at first I had the Mountain West Conference, and then I remembered uh, the third from the bottom, USU Eastern's women's volleyball team actually play in the Scenic West Conference, and they were champions of that conference. So really, really excited that we're now celebrating not only athletics here on the Logan campus, but Eastern is also doing a great, great job. So super glad that we're bringing recognition to USU through our conference athletics. Another uh, accomplishment that we've done here is in the area of, of inclusion and belonging. So uh, we had set up a working group about five years ago that made several uh, recommendations to us. Um, they prepared a draft strategic plan, and uh, one of the things that they strongly recognized is we build the infrastructure to make sure inclusion and belonging is across the entire university, not just Logan, but across the entire uh, university, not just education, but also in our research, outreach, and our community relations. And so we did created the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And then uh, I uh, moved some of the different units that were in various other places under that division, Inclusion Center, Latinx Cultural Center, Disability Resource Center, and the e Diversity and Inclusion Center at USU Eastern. But our real success was hiring Jane Arungu as our inaugural VP for DEI, and I can see her sitting right over there. Hey, Jane. That was the secret ingredients to the sauce. And through Jane's uh, encouragement, we have been able to identify funding for staff and for space. And so if you would ever like to go visit Jane, she is now in Old Main, uh, close to the restrooms. But <laughs> that just happens to be where that office is. But it's a nice office, isn't it, Jane? Yes, and her staff are also there. So very, very excited about that. And then a few new faces or a few familiar faces that have new titles. So one of the things that um, I was encouraged to do as a president was to have more, I guess you could say, boots on the ground. And so where the uh, provost was combined with the extension vice president, I was encouraged to separate those two. And so Larry Smith, who had served in the provost office in many ways, came in as the provost and chief academic officer, and then Robert Wagner, who had served as a vice president, is now the executive vice president. So it actually works beautifully. Uh, Larry's really focusing on the academic side, the colleges, the departments, the faculty, uh, whereas Robert is really helping our group of vice presidents with the infrastructure of the university. We also have added 
uh, three deans. Uh, two of these faces, again, look familiar to you because they've been here at Utah State. Michelle Baker now with science and Jennifer Duncan now with libraries. So very, very glad to have them. Linda Nagel, though, is a new face to USU. And there she is. So if you haven't seen Linda, <laughs> She's here in the audience. Very, very excited to have her here from Colorado State. Jane, I mentioned before, Devin Weiser is here as well. He's the Vice President for Government and External Affairs. He replaced Neil Abercrombie, who went to the governor's office. Devin is a USU Aggie, um, and he was at Weber, but he told me more than once he would love to come back to Utah State. So what an incredible opportunity to bring him. And when we get into the updates of our legislative session, you'll see how incredibly effective he is. And then finally, Finally, Brian Steed, he was in another one of these slides. Brian, I don't think I see him. He's always out and about. He is the executive director for the Jana Quinney Lawson Institute for Land, Water, Air, and what a coup we got in hiring him. He was actually the executive director for Utah's Department of Natural Resources. Um, he's also a graduate of USU in political science. Um, and very, very excited to be back here uh, at Utah State. So great, great new team joining all of my great, great administrative um, uh, organization. So now I'd like to reflect a little on while I was uh, president, some of the things we've accomplished. But the one thing that I realized I didn't do was had a big COVID virus and all the things we did there. So I'm recognizing a few of you, especially for some reason you guys are in the back row, uh, that helped us navigate COVID. And it actually took about 18 to 24 months of our life. And so um, in some of these accomplishments, when I have years, you're gonna notice there's a little gap there around 2020. But um, I actually had someone today, it was an incredible moment. I was over at the Veterans Resource Office and there was a veteran student whose children actually were here from Alaska during COVID. And she, she started to cry, she said, I can't tell you how well the university took care of my children. She said, I have heard stories of just incredibly um, hard things that families had to do during uh, COVID when they were in college, not at USU. So we did it right. So uh, some of the other things though we've done right is student success. We always like good catchy names. So we call it the Aggie Advantage. And we've done so many things to get where that completion has been on an increase over the last five years. One of the things is really beefing up the first year experience. That's our first time students starting with our luminary on the quad. And these students get assigned instructors, classes about 35 people, and those instructors follow up with them to make sure they're doing well at USU. We also established Aggie First Scholars. That's for our first generation students. And we reach out to them, ask them if they want this special attention. They get peer mentors, they get uh, strong advising, they have staff that will help them. It's making a difference. Uh, the first scholars are staying at USU and they're graduating. And then uh, as far as coaching, mentoring, peer to peer, very, very effective. Um, exploratory advising, this was sort of the catch all when a student didn't know where they wanted to go. We've actually been very, very aggressive of reducing the numbers there. We've actually gone from about 4,000 to less than 3,000 in there. We get the students into the majors because getting them done completed in a timely way they need to know what major they're in. So a lot of really heavy lifting inner advising to help students pick that major. Uh, the Habits of Mind is an intensive program for incoming students, actually any student, to help them understand the impact of studying, test taking, reading the tags, going to the library, et cetera. Again, helping students understand how to navigate college. And then finally, the Career Design Center 
It used to be called Career Services, and it was known to help you with your resume. It is now a much more, um, uh, uh, it's a broader array to help students find not only what they want to do in their career, but then how they can get there when they graduate. We believe in scholarships. Just as one example, we gave out 71.9 million of scholarships last year, an incredible number, and over 10,000 students got some type of scholarship aid. We created the Utah State Promise Scholarship. This is for students that are eligible for Pell. Now, Pell isn't full funding. It's actually a range of funding from full tuition and fees to a, a lesser amount. We've made the promise to Pell recipients that if they will come maintain a GPA, we will give them the difference between their Pell and the full tuition and fees for four years. So now students that really are financially struggling can come to USU knowing that they will have support through four years. And then finally, maybe you guys don't appreciate how great scholarship university is, but the students do. They used to have to go track down scholarships to apply, whether it was in the department, the college, the university, et cetera. Now they can go in, do one application, and it goes out to be considered across all scholarships. So lots and lots of great comments on that. Um, so now moving into some other things that have happened over the last few years, the creation of the Janet Quinney Lawson Institute for Land, Water, Air. So the first in, uh, iteration of this was Research Landscape. That was a presentation that we did down at Salt Lake where faculty members would talk about their work in land, water, air. Then we said, okay, now we've got a lot of good publicity. USU does great work in, in those areas, we're going to create an institute. And about six months after that, the Jana Quinney Lawson uh, Family Foundations endowed that for $7 million. Um, so we've actually gotten some additional gifts. Uh, we have a million dollar planned gift that will come in to help with graduate assistantships affiliated with land, water, air. This is one of the stakes we are planting for Utah State. And we're getting a lot of good, good uh, feedback on this. It makes sense to people, and it's what we do as uh, the land grant with super strong uh, areas in engineering, agriculture, natural resource policy, uh, et cetera. And just a couple of things we're working on uh, right now, wildfire, uh, water um, optimization in agriculture, and then some work out uh, to Uinta Basin on the ozone. But a million other projects can follow under the Institute. As I mentioned, we hired Brian Steed to be the executive director, and we also added Anna McIntyre. She's an incredibly talented communications marketing person who does beautiful work, including the annual report that we deliver to the governor and the legislature entitled Utah's Land water and air. And if you haven't had a chance, uh, you can search for that on the website. And I actually was with a legislator at the Capitol this session, said he read the thing from cover to cover. Now that's a pretty good indication of how strong that report is. So very excited about that. Now one of the things that immediately keeps coming up about land, water, air is the Great Salt Lake and what that's hap what's happening with that. Um, there's some incredible photos of how the water is receding in the Great Salt Lake just over the last couple of years. And so USU was asked to organize a strike force with the U of U. And they prepared a report that was released on February 8th. Again, something you may want to look at. Uh, the conclusion or the executive summary said, the situation for the Great Salt Lake is stark 
but hopeful. So, um, and they address certain recommendations. What would be the target level we would like to have in the Great Salt Lake? How would we get new water to the Great Salt Lake to hit that target letter level? And then do monitoring and modeling. Right now, it's more we look at it and say, wow, it looks like it's low. Um, so really get in and understand uh, the water level. And then actually implementing policy on how to keep the Great Salt Lake uh, strong. Now, I, I have to admit, I love having my administrative team because I can ask really questions that I just can't ask anybody else. So Brian came in. I said, well, why do we care about the Great Salt Lake? We can't drink it. We can't put it on crops. Animals don't drink it. Um, it is truly, though, something that is resonating with people on what's happening to our environment and our world. And it's, it's like this poster child of what can we do to keep our world going strong. And uh, so he converted me, and I'm now uh, very, very excited about the work that can be done there. Um, I wanted to include Space Dynamics Lab. I actually have this thing that I tell uh, my administrative team, SDL is Utah State. SDL is for Utah State like the medical school is for the U. It is not something that happens over there and we have no idea what they're doing. It is USU. It is part of our research portfolio. It is part of our success. They include over 150 students as employees every year. They are growing like gangbusters. If you've driven out by the Innovation Campus, you'll see a new building just about every year. Part of that is how strong their reputation is. For instance, they got a $1 billion 10-year contract with the Air Force. They've already started deploying that money. The two new projects that uh, Jed Hancock at SDL suggested, I mentioned, is the thermal management system for the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Telescope is that one that's kicking out those gorgeous pictures of the upper atmosphere, these like colorful, you know, things that nobody had ever known were out there. And we do the thermal management, which is we can't let the telescope get too hot and we can't let the telescope get too cold. And SDL is managing that. They also are launching the atmospheric wave experiment. Uh, let's see, now he explained it that of course, there's upper atmosphere waves, and those waves are affecting the weather here on Earth. So better understanding of those atmospheric waves means we will have better predictions of weather in the long term. Okay, so rain, snow. Don't we wish we had some more snow? Yay! <laughs> um, um, a very cool experiment. So think SDL is USU. Um, we have gained some incredible recognition through national, rec national rankings. One, Carnegie R1 research classification. This has really uh, caught a lot of people's attention, not just in USU, uh, not just in the state, but in the country, even the world. This is a prestigious uh, uh, way to recognize the research success we have. It's based primarily on research funding and graduate student numbers. So a little bit concerned about that lower graduate enrollment. Uh, certainly don't want to lose our R1 research classification. So we have some ideas for investing more for graduate students. We also got Carnegie Community Engagement Classification in 2020. This was a big effort of student affairs as well as all across uh, the university showing that USU cares about people and they do that by helping communities. We, as Bill said, we've been the top 10 public university in Washington Monthly. Um, and then 25 years of online education. Again, one of the stakes we're putting in the ground, we know how to do online. And it's been recognized for many, many years as the top 25 online bachelors in USU World News and World Report. So very excited about that. Um, some interesting bullets there. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I'm not sure what those signal, but um, I also wanted to include a few of the units and programs we've had a start over the last six and a half years. One, iSystem Institute for Transdisciplinary Studies. This is actually a program that helps with resiliency. Resiliency, mental health, how we can really control um, how we're doing in that area. And I've, I've uh, taken some of the lessons and it helps. My only regret is I don't remember to always do it, um, but really cool to have that at USU. Center for Anticipatory Intelligence 2019. This is a program in humanities, but it's a multi-dimensional look at what's happening in the world, uh, mostly politics, mostly world economies. Can we train people to look at big data, maybe uh, social media, up unrest, and help countries predict what's going to happen in the future? I mentioned the Institute for Land, Water, Air, uh, the division for DEI, and then a big one was actually funding we received to start in a four-year college of veterinary medicine. And uh, we're starting to get going on that. So I saw Dirk earlier, but oh, there he is. Dirk, stick that hand up. Dirk is our inaugural dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, he's a very aggressive dean. <laughs> <laughs> but I love working with him. He knows, and that's him in the picture too, uh, doing something there with that cow. Are you pregnancy monitoring? What are you doing? <laughs> You're looking at rumen activity or something. And then I mentioned also Haravi Peace Institute. So, you know, a lot of just great, great ideas that people are doing and making U USU stronger. Oops, what's next? Um, we've done a lot of buildings. Um, life sciences, that seems like a long time ago. That is a, a gorgeous building. Uh, students really love that. Lots of great sun and good art. And, and I love where you can walk in and all the labs are glass. And when we did the ribbon cutting, uh, they had students there, and there was a six-year-old, and he, he said, I want to be a scientist at Utah State after seeing that. I thought that was really cute. Like I said, Space Dynamics Lab growing like gangbusters. We've added new resident halls, a parking terrace, uh, the USU MOA building. And then just the other day, we did a groundbreaking for the Mehdi Haravi Global Teaching and Learning Center. And when I was over there, there were hundreds of people from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. And it suddenly dawned on me, this is the first building they have ever had at USU. We squeeze them into spots all over campus. Uh, even They were even for a while in the art barn, um, but now they're going to have this incredible building. And uh, there was a description of the building, and I thought this was really cool. They're gonna have six different study uh, rooms, but they're more than study. They're communication centers, and they'll be by language. Um, so students who want to go and practice or read or see artifacts and cultural items can go in there. But there will also be uh, TV monitors that they can watch movies in that language and they can communicate with people around the world in that language. So really, really excited about that. We also got approval to break ground. I think it will be uh, in uh, within the year on a new building for the Huntsman School of Business. Now, it's that's a placeholder, experiential learning building. Uh, Doug Anderson is actually going to organize an event in April where a very nice naming will be announced. And this uh, naming is recognition for a leader here in the state of Utah and his, and his uh, spouse's connection to Utah State. So really, really excited about that.
Um, the Domino study is an affectionate name that we've given to moving everyone around the university to try to better align them into the units that they belong. We have colleges that have split and merged and moved, et cetera, so things aren't always in the right configuration. And the first thing that we're going to do to kick off this domino study is we are moving the computer science department out of Old Main and moving them into the SEER, which is the Science and Engineering Research uh, Building, which is a much better fit for them than the fourth floor of Old Main. And so once they move out, then we're moving all sorts of people around. We also have the Mehdi Harabi Center, which allows all of our languages and culture to come together. So really a lot of work, get people together, get them into that community of belonging. Last year I talked about getting funding from the governor's office for the USU Monument Valley Building. And that's actually a schematic right there of that. Monument Valley, Utah, who's been there? That is a beautiful spot, but as you know, it's isolated, it's almost stark in its isolation. And if we, when we construct this building, we are bringing higher education and extension will also be there. We are bringing education and outreach to the, the community of Monument Valley. Uh, the uh, Navajo Nation is very, very excited about this. We do have a little bit of a gap uh, that we still need to raise uh, money for, but my hope is uh, before I step down in July, we will have that money secure and do another groundbreaking. The final one, I don't know how the trustees feel about me sticking this in. I just saw our vice chair, John Ferry, stepped in. Um, but this is something that they've approved in concept, and we are continuing to pursue this. This is actually an opportunity for Utah State University to create a conservation easement of 17,000 acres in the LaSalle Mountains down in Grand County. Um, this would be uh, where we sell the development rights. The money comes to the university, which that money would then go into a very large endowment for work we're doing here, likely in land, water, and air. Uh, but it, it will keep that pristine, incredibly beautiful land as it is today. It'll still allow grazing, hunting, camping, et cetera. So the community is like, wow, this is great. So I'm hoping, I know that won't be done before I step down, but I certainly hope that that can be in place by 2024. Okay, legislative updates. Uh, some of you, I think, came specifically for this. All right. In the legislative session, they approve money that starts July 1st and then goes till July or June 24th. So we call it the fiscal year 24. We were awarded, uh, the state appropriated, i.e. approved, 8.75% salary compensation for all state employees. But in an interesting twist, they distributed 7.65% of that to the higher education institutions. Now normally, they just, in the past, they distributed 75%, and then we were able to raise tuition to cover that. But as many, many people are concerned, uh, the governor put a moratorium on increased tuition. And therefore, we were not able to raise that difference uh, through that mechanism. So we are distributing 7.65 salary compensation. And through a lot of feedback from the executive committee, from the staff and um, staff employee, let's see, it's SEA, Association, as well as Faculty Senate and the Budget and Faculty Welfare Committee. Uh, through conversations with them, we are planning to distribute 6.0% across our employees that are paid by state appropriations, and but it is performance-based. So if a person is on a development plan or has not met expectations, 
uh, of their job in the last year. Unfortunately, they will not be getting that increase. The rest of the money will go into something we call the flex pool that will be used for salary compression, equity retention, and merit. And I have promised the faculty senate and SEA that I will help our units, the colleges, and the vice president units to distribute how that flex was applied. So we'll be sending that information out to you in your units. Finally, uh, we will be able to distribute back to colleges and other units uh, money that was uh, given to us for increases in graduate student assistantships and wage hourly. So some ability to raise those folks' salary as well. Another thing that we always watch during the legislative session is how much we get in performance funding. Performance funding has been around since before I was president, but they always change the metrics. And once again, they changed them this year. But um, they used 2021-22 performance for USU in the areas of access, so that's enrollments of students, completion, that's awards, high yield awards, these are uh, things that the Division of Workforce Services say are high demand, high salary, and then uh, research. And when everything got calculated, we could have, we'd hoped to achieve $7 million. Uh, but as I showed you on an earlier slide, we did not do as well as we've done last year in completions. And because we didn't have as many people getting awards, we also suffered uh, dropped a bit in high yield, and that meant that instead of seven million, we got 5.2 million. And so when I think of the future, I am concerned about this COVID effect on completion and high yield, and if that might affect for the next few years this performance funding that we get from the, the state. Now of that, we're gonna pull a million dollars off to help pay for the faculty promotions that were awarded this year. And then we do, for several years now, I've done budget hearings where is, uh, the deans and vice president come in with their prioritized list of how they would like to uh, seek new funding. But to prioritize in this year, coming year, we're going to use the Aggie Action 2028. Uh, that's our new strategic plan and strategies that can move us forward on that plan. Um, then we got some legislative um, appropriations. One, earthquake engineering, uh, 2.5 million to buy equipment. They're big shaker tables. They're gonna be down uh, by the water lab. Um, and uh, the U, we kept getting asked, are you working with the U? The U measures earthquakes. We engineer for earthquakes. So it makes total sense that uh, this earthquake engineering center is now established here at USU. It turns out that if we had an earthquake, it's not just the buildings that would be a problem, it's infrastructure, water, electricity, IT. And some of the places that have met, had major earthquakes, it's months, if not years, till they actually can use their toilets because water mains, sewer systems are demolished by earthquake. And so uh, the Earthquake Engineering Center is going to help Utah uh, be better prepared for earthquakes. Uh, SPIRE is the electrified transportation center that was started by Regan Zane a few few years ago, and the legislature has given Aspire $2.1 million ongoing funding, not for research, but application of the research to areas in Utah. So for electrified transportation, you can have cars, buses, trains, planes, et cetera, and the Aspire uh, team who works with uh, U of U, BYU, and eight other institutions, has incredible research on how to make that happen. And so now the state can come to Aspire to say, we want an electrified train system between Ogden and Salt Lake. We want to put uh, uh, increased electrified vehicles in you know, new developments, et cetera. And Aspire will now be able to do that. Another uh, legislative um, funding we got was the Bingham Entrepreneur 
Entrepreneurship and Energy Research Center. This is actually in the Uinta Basin at our Vernal campus. And Seth Lyman and his team have been doing research that help mitigate the effect of natural resource extraction on air quality in Uinta Basin. Now, the industry was pretty nervous about what this research would make them do. But as time went on, they realized it absolutely is helping them. It's reducing uh, the impact on the ozone, the air quality out there, and it's keeping those industries growing. So not only government is liking the research, so is the industry. And to demonstrate that, they're giving uh, the research center $400,000 ongoing funding. Another program, I love this one. If I had a second language, I would jump into this, but I don't. Uh, this is for um, increasing the interpreter uh, that we have here in the state. And these people help navigate um, in healthcare situations, in community service situations, for people that have limited English proficiency. And Utah State now will be delivering a certificate program for people who have a second language to learn the terminology, uh, the confidentiality, what it takes to be an interpreter. Um, very, very excited about this. I think it can really help uh, our rural communities, our urban communities, communities get the kind of help there. Now, uh, we already have quite a bit of expertise here in Spanish at USU, but this money will be uh, used to add another faculty member and a coordinator, but we hope that other languages will soon follow, particularly in those languages that are spoken by refugees who come to the state of Utah. So very, very excited about that one. Um, we also got uh, 1.2 million in ongoing funding, although USU is sharing that money with the U of U, Weber, and Utah Valley University. Um, but it is to increase a workforce that can go into underserved communities in the areas of behavioral health, mental health, um, especially in rural Utah. And nobody can do it better than Utah State getting into uh, education in rural Utah through our statewide program. So uh, very excited about that one. Finally, here's some more uh, electrified trains, agriculture, rural small business in innovation. That's to use e-commerce to help our agricultural producers get their products out. Uh, not through sale to uh, retail, but uh, rather online. Uh, the Janet Quinney Lawson got uh, $300,000 ongoing. We'll probably be looking at many grants there for graduate and undergraduate student funding. Utah Women Leadership Project, this is uh, someone, this is led by Susan Matson in the Huntsman School, $500,000 ongoing. Center for School of the Future got some money to help Davis School District improve uh, some issues they have there. Veterans Education Loan Repayment, this is a great program where students that have high uh, debt when they come out of college can get that paid if they're willing to serve as a veterinarian in Utah. And then we're actually with the J Jenna Quinning Lawson Institute, we'll be looking at Bear Lake, similar to what they're doing with the Great Salt Lake. So finally, I'm gonna conclude with the Aggie Action Plan. This is our strategic plan. It's been, gosh, almost a year since it, we kicked it off to start moving uh, into things that we need to do at Utah State for the future. And a special thanks, I mean, huge special thanks to the people on that committee. They've met weekly, every other week, monthly, through emails, et cetera, making sure that we have a strong strategic plan. So mission, vision, strategic direction. These are fabulous. They are so fitting for USU. The mission, we're a premier land and space grant institution committed to excellence, access, and inclusion. The vision, we empower all people to lead successful lives of involvement, innovation, and impact. That's what we do. That is what we do. And then our strategic direction, we have exceptional education, research and discovery, and community outreach. So right there, 
we have summed up the greatness of Utah State. And then um, under those, we have pillars that are listed here. First one is, in short term, uh, education. Next one's research, creative excellence. Third one's outreach to communities. And then the fourth is us as a community. And then um, what is happening right now is the committee of the Aggie Action Plan has, has requested uh, strategies. How are we going to move the needle on all of these pillars? How can we really make an impact? How can we make these things happen? And like I said, I will use those uh, prioritization of those strategies through this next round of budget hearing so we can start making a, a difference on those pillars. So I hope that you agree that this strategy, the strategic plan, is a fantastic uh, road uh, map for Utah State in the coming years, as well as recognizing how incredible we are. Um, finally, um, I suspect you guys all saw this, but I was so excited I included it here today, and that's our commencement speaker, Paul Jones, shown on a previous slide. He is the president of Fort Valley State University and an alumnus of Utah State, and he will be our commencement speaker. And then we have three honorary degrees. Jonathan Bullen is a businessman, an entrepreneur, a graduate of Utah State. Um, just to give you a little bit of a scope of what he's done, he's been very, very involved in the development at Sugar House in Salt Lake, and he and his uh, design team will be involved in the development, design and development of Point of the Mountain, a uh, big, big effort coming uh, through the state. Mia Love is a former congresswoman uh, who lives in Saratoga Springs, and when I called her, she was so excited. Her two daughters are here at Utah State, and her oldest daughter is graduating in aerospace science, I think, or engineering, and so what a treat for her daughter to see her mom get an honorary uh, degree. And then finally, Gary Stevenson is probably a recognized person for many of you. He uh, is a co-founder of Icon Fitness when he was a businessman, but, but he's probably best known for being a member of the Quorum of the Twelve in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Gary is a very, very proud graduate of Utah State. His father was vice president for administrative services here. Gary tells a lot of great stories. Um, when he was a student, he actually was employed by facilities and used to mow the lawn around the various buildings uh, that are here. So really excited about that. Okay, so final slide. As you heard, I'm stepping down as president. And it's with incredible emotion that my time as president is drawing to a close. For instance, as Bill said, this is my last state of the university. And it's been hard. Everything's sort of a last time of this and a last time of that. But I have absolutely loved being president. I mean, it, it was never in my thought that that's what I wanted to achieve, but I was given that opportunity. So when I step down, I'm moving back to the Department of Animal, Dairy, and Veterinary Sciences. I am a tenured faculty member there, and my department head is here, Abby Benninghoff, and she has actually has reserved an office for me on the second floor. I don't think it's a broom closet, um, but I would even accept that. And then I will start doing uh, my research projects. It's what I started here at Utah State, and I can't think of any better way to end at Utah State. But no matter where I go, or where I am, or what I'm doing, my heart will be filled with pride and love for this incredible university. And it is incredible because of the people, the students, the staff, the faculty, the administrators, the alumni, and the supporters. You guys are what have made this so exceptional. And thank you for letting me be president. <laughs>
One of the things, the comments that was just delivered to me was I forgot one of our buildings. Uh, that's the NEMA, Nora Eccles Harrison Museum of Arts. Um, many of you have seen it, it's right across from the performance hall. We are actually raising money and we're almost there to add an educational unit onto that building. It is going to be phenomenal. We have 5,000, uh, let's see, what are they called? Items, something. Accessions, I'm not quite sure, 5,000 pieces of art, and we can only display about 200 of them at any one time. So there's amazing things down there. This educational unit will actually be uh, our storage, but you can peruse the storage, and for students and, and art enthusiasts, they can go in there and uh, actually learn more about those uh, Exhibit. So sorry, Katie, um, but that's also something very, very exciting. I hope that will have a groundbreaking in the very near future as well. Okay, do I have any questions or is it too late in the day? And everybody went to home. Oh, yeah. So I got a quick question. You mentioned that we should reach out if we want to participate in the Fort Valley Partnership. Yes. Who should we reach out to? Me. Oh, I would love to. If you feel uncomfortable doing that, Robert Wagner okay. is actually managing the partnership as well. But uh, I was talking with a visitor, Sonny uh, Ramaswamy, who's with the Northwest Accreditation. I told him about this partnership, and I said, how can we make more things happen? And he said, do it not just from the top down do it from the bottom up. And so I thought this would be a terrific opportunity to ask people if they would like to get engaged, whether it's hosting students here, whether it's sending students there, hosting and exchanging faculty, maybe working with joint curriculum, developing new programs. I'd love to hear some ideas. So Thank you. me or Robert. Thank you. Okay. President, we do have some questions from okay, Aggie Cast and online. Okay. Um, let's start off with, can you tell us more about why R1 matters and what we can do to keep it? Well, um, why does R1 matter? There's only, I think, 140 institutions in the country that have this designation. So it's like any ranking. You know, people do pay attention to that. We know that faculty look at R1 ranking when they're considering moving here for a faculty position. Graduate students look at that to determine whether they want to be part of USU. It's helpful on grant proposals. It's, a, it's like a stamp of, of certification that we know how to do R1. Um, and I've noticed that the state is pretty darn excited that they have two research institutions and two R1 institutions. So they used to sort of talk about the flagship research institution and then Utah State, and now they recognize we are right there with you. It's based on primarily funding, research funding, and like I said, grad students. And of particular importance are graduate students in the STEM areas. So uh, our funding is just doing fabulous. Our grad students, we need to pay some attention to that to keep that strong. Now, we, oh, there's Anna. Anna, how are you? Anna McIntyre, the uh, Associate Director of the Institute. As I mentioned, for example, this funding that we got with the Institute of Land, Water, and Air from the state, we might use that for adding more graduate assistance in that area. So whatever, also Matt White with his Aggie Impact, getting more funding for undergraduate research and graduate funding. The more we can help fund our graduate and undergraduate research program, the stronger our research engine will be and the better we can assure ourselves to keep that designation. That's it? <laughs> nope, we're gonna, not gonna let you off that easy. So okay. another question from uh, online. It seems most scholarships offered at USU are two years to get us in the door, and they are not very many for continuing students past the second year. What can USU do to help us? 
Wow, I feel like somebody pitched me a softball. Um, so this has been a real problem. Not only are many of our scholarships two years, a lot of our scholarships are one year. And this is making it difficult for students to count on or to be relaxed about how that additional funding will come if they come to USU. I mean, here's one year, hope it turns out in the future. And yet we know our students are getting continuing scholarships through our colleges and our departments. But what we've been doing is recruiting a student with the university scholarship. Once they get here, we say, go over to the department and the college and get the rest of the funding. Well, they're definitely getting it. Like I showed, 10,000 students are getting scholarship funding. They just didn't know it when they came. And I'll tell you, it doesn't, it's not that convincing to say, parents, don't worry about it. They'll get funding once they get here. So instead, we're working with the colleges and the departments to say, let's pool money. It's actually called a pool and match. And the scholarships will still be put on the right people. But now that we know how much total dollars we have, we can start making offers of the total dollars rather than just the university recruitment dollars. And I'm not sure, Matt, when will that be in place? Not till fall 24? Yeah. Yeah, so I wanna give a special thank you to the deans. Um, they, they still give it to exactly their students. It's not a scholarship in egg. We'll go to a scholarship or a student in engineering, none of that. But it's allowing us to do the packaging up front instead of once the student gets here and then give them the rest of the package. So thanks. It'll make a huge difference, I think, in our recruitment, especially students that are financially challenged. President, I'll just also add that in your slides, you did mention Scholarship Universe, which is another great resource for students that are looking for scholarships yes. that are on. Yes, thank you. You guys are waiting for the treats, except I don't think there are any. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we forgot that. <laughs> All right, President, so we have another one for you. Since the announcement of you stepping down, there have been a few departments and key positions across the university that have gone and have not, they have not progressed in hiring the process um, while we wait for a new president. What's being done to support and progress those units as they wait? How long will the executive administration make, make sure that this is not a burden um, just being passed on to the new president? Oh, it's not a burden, it's an opportunity. Really. So the one I think they're referring to are the three vice presidents. We have three interim vice presidents. Interim vice president for statewide campuses, Rich Edgeberger. He was actually going to step down July 1st. I convinced him to say till December 31st. We have interim uh, vice president for athletics slash athletic director, Jerry Bovee, and interim vice president for student affairs. Eric Olson. So um, before I made my decision to step down, I was getting ready to start filling those. And then after I announced it, um, some people got back to me and it made sense. I would be hiring someone else's close administrative team. And it's not really fair on both sides, I think, to do that. And so we have incredibly capable people in the interim positions right now. And then when the new president comes, the new president can start searches uh, for those replacements. And all three interims have agreed to stay for, you know, not as long as it takes, uh, but I think within six months, those positions could be filled. Again, uh, I feel like they're going great. The interims are treated just like the regular. They have the same uh, authority. They have the same uh, connection to me. They have the same uh, opportunities to work on initiatives. But uh, once the new president comes, that individual will make the permanent selection. So I hope that makes sense and seems like a reasonable a way forward.
He's waiting for some of you guys to do <laughs> questions. So if you were lined up here at the microphone, he'd probably do alternate. <laughs> so, uh, President, we have a question. I feel question. like I'm on a game show. Okay, <laughs> what's going to be? Okay. Um, can you tell us what you see as some of the challenges U.S. will face in the next year? Um, in all truth, I'm, I'm concerned about the performance funding for the coming year. We had to give our goals for next year, and it's going to be based on the 2022-23 completion and high yield awards. We are in March 23. We have a darn good idea of what those numbers are going to do. But somebody, we're told the legislature and also the Board of Higher Ed wants those goals to be aspirational, stretch goals. So we were actually uh, told we had to go for um, uh, these goals. And like I said, uh, we have a pretty good idea where we're gonna be at the end of this academic year and it may not be at those goal levels. Now, what they'll do is um, uh, they'll um, adjust how much we get in ongoing funding for performance funding, just like they did this year. We, of the 35 million that went to all institutions, USU could have been uh, eligible to get 7 million of that, but because we didn't meet our goals, we got 5.1 million. And so I, I do think that this coming year, uh, that will be a challenge. Um, it will, I do like not having to raise tuition uh, to meet the salary compensation gap, but uh, that is going to be hard to navigate year after year after year. Um, so I hope some conversation can occur about that. Uh, maybe the only other thing is, what are we going to do with all the melted snow? <laughs> that looks like kind of a worry. But, I, you know, I, I think the university is incredible, and, and it's in incredible shape. We are getting so many good, um, you know, feedback on how well we're doing, so I think it's going great. One more time, he's looking out to you guys. Oh, Abby, I'll ask a question. All right, here we go. Make it a good one. So uh, last fall, you uh, previewed a new m budget model that you were oh. conceiving for performance funding. Since you're transitioning, I understand that you've kind of put the I brakes did. on that. I did pull it back. Do you anticipate the next president to jump on that really quickly? So given that we have these new metrics from UCI that we need to meet, Right. So Abby is a department head, and I met with the department heads in fall. Uh, and at that point, I really did talk about this new funding model. And the idea was that departments could earn more ongoing money by increasing majors, by improving retention, by uh, speeding up completion, and helping with Award. So it was actually to incentivize departments to help us with these performance goals um, and, and get the money back to where the work was being done. To me, it seems like absolute common sense to do this, but um, I hope to have a chance to talk to the new president and um, encourage that new president to consider this. Um, I think getting us all engaged and all, you know, entrepreneurial about how to, you know, do this legislative funding would make us all uh, do better. So I hope that, that I do get that chance. President, how does USU show the return on investment of a Utah State education? Hmm. Well... Hmm. Hmm. Uh, where's my, where's Bill? Bill. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Bill, get back up the microphone. So I would like to say everybody should go to usu.edu slash worth it. All right. It's a website dedicated to talking about and showing why a Utah State University degree is worth it, but also why it's 
worth it for the in investment in the individual. So we've got a little dilemma here in Utah where we have eight institutions. They are not all equal. We have the two research, four regional universities, and two community colleges. But many, many families still look up the list price for tuition and make their choice there on whether it on whether they can afford they actually use that word afford to send them to certain institutions so we're at four thousand dollars a semester some of those other institutions are at three thousand dollars a semester and I shouldn't like turn up my nose at that because in getting a bachelor's, that's uh, eight semesters, that's $8,000 different. But we believe that $8,000 is worth it because of all the experiences they can have here at Utah State. Undergraduate research, study abroad, career design center, the peer mentoring, on and on and on. Um, so it's just, we've got to keep conveying that it is it is worth that 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 more that greater investment in the college degree now we also have incredible anecdotes from employers a lot of engineering firms say that if they have a choice and uh, to hire a USU graduate versus a graduate from another Utah institution, they will always take the Utah State graduate. So it's placing our students in internships, um, uh, you know, career explorations, whatever, so that employers can see how great we are. It's just, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's been a challenge, but I think we're starting to break through it. And, and then I said, they look at the list price. That's the other frustrating thing. Over 10,000 of our students don't pay the list price. Um, and then a lot of other students get financial aid. So the list price is actually not paid by all our students. And we're trying to figure out ways to explain that. I do think this idea of, of, of combining university with Department of College scholarships into a four-year award will actually make a big difference as well in recruiting students to Utah State. Isn't it like 10 p.m.? <laughs> So, okay, so President, six more minutes. <laughs> there, if there are no more questions from those that are here, I would like to just end with a comment that came in that is oh. not a question, okay. um, but that I think um, all of us would agree with. President Kaka, thank you for your genuine and authentic love for this institution and everyone involved with it. Your leadership will be sorely missed. We hope that you know how much USU loves you. Oh, okay. So thank you. All right. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>